Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response, uh, a series we've started over, well, just two years ago uh, in response to the pandemic, obviously. Uh, and this is part 58. Uh, we've done 57 of these already, and they are all, uh, well, they're hosted and recorded by IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, our partner and co-producer in this series. And uh, they're also hosting and recording the session. Uh, and the session will be put up on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, uh, where the, all the previous sessions are residing. And we've had, uh, we've had roughly 6,000 registrations for the series and 140 something outstanding speakers. So I recommend all of you to uh, run through that list and look for anything that might appeal to you. These are now all moved on to YouTube for open play. So welcome back. We've been kind of uh, missing here for uh, a, a couple of months uh, at the end of the year. Uh, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're uh, uh, open collaboration of libraries doing interesting things with technology primarily, and it's a fairly broad uh, mission and charter. Uh, most of what we've been working on the last few years besides this is uh, wireless uh, technologies and how libraries can leverage new wireless to extend this extremely valuable service of access to the internet and other digital services, which is something I think we'll probably hear about today is how that, how important that might be. This is what it really started in the beginning. Uh, we looked at these four primary kind of categories. This was just, I mean, when the thing, if you can think back when this, when the pandemic was declared, it was like, what's going on? I mean, what is happening? And we just started these as a way to talk about that and the things that uh, this rough taxonomy we use was internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure as impact areas uh, and, and demand areas, as it turned out. So that's a lot has happened in the last 24 months, and maybe we'll hear about some of that today. So this quote, assuring access to public information uh, is an essential service, especially in a health crisis or any crisis. And who does that? Well, libraries do that. They do that better than anybody else. Uh, today, we are very happy to kick off uh, our State of the States thread, a kind of a mini series within the series, uh, uh, hearing from prominent state librarians from Washington, Texas, and Delaware, uh, who were so pleased to have with us, Sarah, Gloria, and Annie today, uh, to share their experiences and their outlooks and, you know, where are we going? Um, this is an emphasis we've made on uh, public access. We think everyone should be close to some kind of a library access. You know, I mean, a third, but pre-pandemic, roughly 80 million people, adults, access the internet at a library. I mean, that's just a mind-boggling number. So our notion of these uh, uh, neighborhood library access stations is some combination of these really valuable kind of uh, kiosk or call box kind of things. Uh, everybody should have this nearby, you know, the signs is, you know, just around the corner. It can look like anything, you know, this is the Libraries Without Borders Initiative, WALI, uh, really a great idea. If you're not aware of that, I would check it out. Just look it up, WALI and Bibliothèque Sans Frontières. Uh, this is our best image. I think this is from Tennessee. This is our this is our kind of our ideal kiosk. It's a uh, you know uh, it's it's sheltered. It has electrical outlet. It's comfortable and it's in the open air. It even has a little free library next to it. So I think really cool. Uh, uh, or it could be inside of a building at a corner of city hall or some other public space, and you know even could be staffed if, if it worked out that way which, you know, roving librarians are not without precedent. Uh, the pandemic is not the only disaster that's happening. Uh, there's, there's, you know, climate crisis. We started calling it climate change, 
I don't know why we stopped calling it global warming. It's global warming. We're collecting heat and the heat is triggering these, these uh, extreme weather events and, and they're increasing in their severity and frequency as this billion dollar bust uh, chart shows. And that's from, that was 2018. And it's just gotten worse. Uh, the IP, IPCC said, you know, major changes are inevitable and irreversible. It's a point we want to make. Oh, here's the, the more current graph. You can see there are even more of them. Uh, uh, and so the, our point would be that this is uh, the new world that we're in. And it's going to, it's going to, we're going to stay in it. I don't really want to open with this sort of a gloomy scenario, but it's not my scenario. It's the scenario. And um, we anticipate that this is going to get worse, that we're going to have more of these events, whether it's, it's uh, you know, 115 degree heat in, in uh, Washington state, the, you know, the home of rain, or it's floods in, in uh, uh, Indiana, it's freezing temperatures today in Texas, or, or it's hurricanes in, in Delaware. I mean, it's just gonna keep going. So yeah, we need to mitigate, we need to stop putting carbon in the air, we need to find a way to take it out. But in the meantime, it's just gonna get more uh, uh, extreme and difficult. And we say, anticipate that it's gonna to fall to librarians as second responders to help adaptation. We're in for a long pull of adaptation strategies. Can we do it? Yeah, look, this is a picture of, the, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Jupiter from the South Pole. We, we took a picture of Jupiter from the South Pole. Can we do it? Yeah, we've got the technology, but can we actually, maybe we can't do it. I don't know if anybody saw this it was a few years ago after uh, a Jurassic Park movie and they put out a, a survey, you know, did people and dinosaurs live at the same time? And I look at this graph. So starting from around 11 o'clock, 16% are not sure, 14% definitely they did. You know, they saw Fred Flintstone riding a dinosaur or probably 27%, probably not. Okay, 18, well, only 25% that definitely not. I put all the other categories in the same category. Are you serious? <laughs> You're not sure? Probably not. There's no way. You know, so it's it's a it's kind of the flip side of what we can do is what we think we know, which is eh, not much. Uh, so to the business at hand of the day, we have uh, Sarah Jones, the state librarian from uh, the state of Washington, Gloria Moraz from Texas and Annie Norman from Delaware. Annie is filling in or has joined us, let me put it that way. She's oh, here on her own, she's not filling in for anybody. But as a matter of fact, we did have uh, 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 a cancellation from the, from the Ohio library and she came down with a cold, we hope, and asked to uh, uh, do a later date. And we do plan to have more of these uh, over I think Don may momentarily have frozen on us there. This has happened earlier. I think his connection to Escalito isn't always as stable as it should be. And um, <clears throat> I think I might therefore actually jump in and suggest that Sarah kicks us off already. Um, I, yep. I will also ah. remove Don steer sharing. All right, and well, I'm- I'm hand over to you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And um, actually, Don's um, uh, unstable internet is a, a, a really interesting part of this conversation. So, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Good morning to everyone. I assume it's morning in most places. And uh, I'm really happy to be here, especially with my other esteemed state librarian colleagues. So um, just a, a little bit about me is that, especially as it relates to COVID and, and how we've dealt with the pandemic is I've had uh, a foot in, in two places in library land. I was the library director in Marin, in Marin County. So where um, Don is from there in Sausalito and 
uh, any of you that for the geography, um, Marin County is just north of San Francisco. In fact, if you cross the Golden Gate Bridge, two thirds of the way over you're in, in Marin County. It's re very well known for you know, being pretty wealthy um, and uh, having great education and great resources, which is also true. But one of the things that is not as well known about Marin County is in, its designation is in California is in, as the most in, um, inequitable county um, in the state of California and probably can get that unfortunate designation maybe almost nationwide because it has the wealthiest and most um, resourced people on the, on the planet and it has the people with much fewer resources and um, much littler access. And then beyond that, what is incredibly interesting is that the digital access is very uneven. Um, as you, you, know, you think of uh, the Bay Area and Silicon Valley and the technology, but with the stability of, um, of internet and broadband is, is not consistent and, uh, sorry. <laughs> at a timer. Hopefully it won't go off again. So uh, anyway, that that's that's such an interesting part of, of um, I think what we're talking about day, today is really um, digital equity and that divide. So as I said, I was running the Marin County Free Library. So the moment the pandemic hit, we um, you know had to do what all of you had to do, shut libraries down, um, decide what we were going to do about you know where what people did when they couldn't be in the building, the quarantining of materials, I mean, so many things that everyone here is, is well aware of. And I actually had the pleasure of being one of the first speakers um, in, this, uh, in this series as my, uh, in my role in Marin County. And it was to talk about Wi-Fi hotspots because we libraries, you know, in our response really just immediately said, well, how these students are gonna be with no internet access. They're expected to be taught online. So we need to roll out hotspots in Marin County. We were able to find the resources to put a thousand Wi-Fi hotspots out in our community. And that was a, a wonderful and great thing, but you know, come to learn, um, we put a lot of them in people's hands that never turned them on because they didn't even know how to approach that. And if they could get them on, they didn't know what to do with them and how to access the learning opportunities. So I think that really speaks about one of the things that, that we have completely um, approached here uh, and is how that we get access to everyone and um, how the pandemic really opened up that divide in a way that we all knew about, but that we saw far more clearly. So uh, in February of 21, I, I took the job as the Washington State Librarian and I had been a state librarian before, so I was pretty well aware of what, uh, what that meant and what it means to me and why it was important is you really get to have some access to making policy and, and um, moving your uh, libraries uh, through support in a variety of ways statewide to uh, be better and to be able to be more, um, to do these things that are so important to all of us more effectively. I think it's really interesting that bookends that I see in this, in um, the pandemic is uh, many of us uh, went to the Public Library Association in Nashville Tennessee, and I have a librarian here in the state of Washington who's certain that they um, contracted COVID there, and I think that's probably a really good possibility that was happening, um, because we now find out that it was, you know, present in the U.S. far before uh, we thought it was, um, and uh, there, you know, there's a good chance when we put all of ourselves together in that conference that it was alive and it was infecting folks and uh, you know starting this journey that we have that's been um, you know um, just so challenging so and then i think it's really interesting that we're all very hopeful um, and many many people are planning to attend the you know public library association is an every other year conference so it's going to be in portland um, near my state and we're hoping that's in person although it's a hybrid model so two really interesting bookends that uh, um, that, you know, of, of uh, PLA in Nashville and then PLA in Portland. So certainly hoping that the Portland thing turns out as planned at this moment. But one of the interesting things is I was the public librarian when I went to Nashville and some of my staff actually went to a program on curbside services, not knowing anything that, about a pandemic. But how helpful can I tell you that was that they were ready to go and so had a playbook. And so the moment we had to do curbside services, uh, you know, we were out there uh, really quickly doing that. Um, and 
I, it, it made such a difference to, because the, the idea when buildings closed and what that might look like, um, you know, certainly uh, had such impact. And I think one of the things that um, I, you know, and I, I really appreciate Don's slides before, uh, many of us that have been in the profession for a number of years have had this conversation about essential and non-essential services and people who provide essential and non-essential services. And many times, um, you know, if, they, if times get tough or there's, you know, any kind of issue, essential is defined, you know, really as a uh, public safety and um, education and uh, hospitals and all of those kind of things. And libraries don't necessarily, um, oh boy, did I, I hope, uh, can people still hear me? Yes, you're clear. Oh, good. All right. I saw something else pop up. So on the screen. Uh, so anyway, uh, the uh, this uh, this question about our libraries essential is it is my uh, belief that it's been answered. We are. We are absolutely essential. Now we'll we'll, we'll get those definitions and and certainly um, you know the, some of those things are actually codified in law. But what we found is the community said you have to support us. We have to find ways to get information, reading materials, we have to support students in education. So all of those things, I think, um, I think that's sea change for us to now be seen as um, an, an essential service that is absolutely um, necessary. Sarah, I'm excuse me, there a couple me weeks ago and... um, Whoever hit screen share, Ann Watson. Could it's you Wendy. Wendy, it's your screen. Uh, okay. I've just I've just unshared it. All right, thank you. Sorry, sir. Oh no, no worries. I, I saw that too, and I was just <laughs> that's why I thought maybe I'd been um, uh, been released, and then you weren't hearing me. So <laughs> so anyway, no. uh, back to the uh, the conversation is that I I I truly believe that that question has ultimately and finally been answered. Of libraries are an absolutely essential part of a community. So as we look at masks, and again, I'm not saying anything that people across the whole uh, world have an experience with this, but service disruptions. And then as we tried to go back to in-person services and six foot distancing and masks and all the protective, uh, you know, washing everything, all those things uh, were, you know, we're not things in our wheelhouse, not things we knew to do, but libraries and librarians are, and workers are so resilient. So they figured it out. I think one of the things about services that um, you know uh, has been such a challenge, and I know it's true in this state and in many other states, is you know the mass mandate. So recently, we have a few libraries that are going uh, just very recently are going back to curbside only because the uh, the enforcement of mass mandates is so problematic, and that for staff to um, enforce that it it makes them unsafe. It's um, it, it's hugely problematic. So. I think, you know, again, when we look at what, what traditional things and what we might have been taught in library school, uh, enforcing public health mandates was not something that we expected. And of course, I think it's incredibly unfortunate. Um, you know, at, at any time when these issues, um, uh, are the something that people are unhappy about gets taken out on the service provider who's just trying to do their job, you certainly, you know, we're all very disappointed about that, but it is in fact um, a reality. And it's uh, one that continues to go on. And I think we'll see it even more because there's increasing pressure to let go of mask mandates. Um, I was at the Seattle Public Library um, maybe about a month ago, uh, watching a staff member trying to enforce um, someone, you know, no, and their mask was below their nose. And the staff member very politely said, you know, it's gotta be over your nose. And, you know, the person went off a litany of, um, you know, foul language and and um, all those kind of things. And I just think, wow, that's just, it's really a shame that that's what the library worker doing their best in very difficult situations um, has a, to deal with that too. So as far as other service things, I think some of the things that have really been positive is we've all pushed so many online um, services. And I think that for a long time, we thought it was gonna be, you know, we were still having trouble with adoption. But I think COVID really helped adoption of online services. I've talked to so many patrons in, in all kinds of places that said, you know, I resisted it for a long time, but that's what I had to do. I wanted my I wanted the resources. So I I figured it out. And then from a budget perspective, all of us, I think, 
any way we could, we uh, put way more materials into uh, resources into those online things. I also think some of the shifts have been good. I have been able to visit quite a lot of libraries in the state of Washington. And some of the things that I think are good about this situation is people have been able to shift some resources away from things that they wanted to for a long time, but they haven't been able to. Um, in particular, the disruption to print in terms of magazines and newspapers, totally disrupted. Even if, you know, number one, they were difficult to get, the libraries, the deliveries, all those things got completely disrupted. But the daily newspaper people were, you know, have been disrupted for almost the full two years. And I think that it's, it's one of the things that maybe as we come back using resources in different ways um, than uh, and that, and not that that's a bad thing, but it's, we all, always have limited resources. So, and I think we served, uh, you know, a few patrons um, with those kind of uh, vast, you know, especially the vast majority of periodicals in the public libraries I would run, they would be many, many that were touched by very, very few, and most of the things were online. So I think that's a disruption um, that's a positive. I think a other disruption that's really a positive is the fact that programming is virtual. Uh, when I ran a 10 library system um, and you wanted to do programming, you need to figure out if you need to do that 10 times. You don't have to think about that anymore. You can do it once and share it not only in your jurisdiction, but worldwide. And I think that's an incredible, um, disruption that's going to stick with us. The, uh, I think the other thing that I've really seen is, um, and I know all of you have, is staff burnout at all levels. Um, here in the state of Washington, I, I think we're looking at something pretty close to a dozen directors. Uh, 60, there are 60 systems here that are either retiring, resigning, um, taking other positions. A lot of times it's other positions not in the library world. Um, and that's just representative of all levels. We really are seeing people that are saying, you know, this is enough, I, I, I can't do this. I will say from a leadership perspective, these last two years have been the hardest in a 30 year career. Um, finding the um, inner strength to keep going is, is incredibly challenging, especially, you know, and not in climate change, the, the politics of the world, the getting in the news every day and so many things are just uh, very depressing. Um, we're you know, now seeing from library land and I know Gloria um, is, is one of the states that's really addressing this. We're seeing vast and um, coordinated works at censorship. So it's, it's a, some it's certainly the most challenging times in my career. So one of the things Don wanted us to talk about and I will just end with this to give everyone else plenty of time is just where we are with broadband funds. And where we are in the state of Washington, I think is probably pretty reflective of where everyone is, is there's a ton of money out there and it's flowing like a fire hose, but without intention is, is my perception. So here in this state, we I think that we're in our legislative session right now, we're halfway through it. This is kind of a a smaller session every other year um, that, you know, there's a large session that's budget and then a session that is, um, you know, policy directed, but not designed to be, you know, big picture things. I think there's something in the neighborhood of five to seven broadband bills. They overlap, they replicate, um, who knows what will turn out from them. One of the things that's very positive for us is that um, one of the legislators leading this is very um, uh, has had one of my library staff members um, on the committee to think about this for uh, for a long time, several years. And so, one of the things that we're hopeful for is to do a study um, and try to understand what the gap is in digital literacy, because we're seeing lots of programs being put out there. Sometimes programs that are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of dollars with six month timeframes and no planning. And you're just like, how can that possibly be effective? So we're very hopeful that here in the state of Washington, we could do an assessment gap, do some real definitions of di digital literacy and move forward with those resources um, in a positive way. I actually wrote down that one of the things is it seems to me in broadband, we are in that classic um, firearm ready we, we don't, we're not thinking about this. We're just like, how much can we throw out there and hope that something good happens? And, you know, it's been my experience that very little good will happen when that's your approach. But um, I'm hopeful. Uh, I think if we pick up where we were left off um, when there was um, 
uh, broadband funding, BTOP funding, and that we find out where we the connectivity is lost. And then more importantly, we find out who doesn't have the skills, even if we connect them, and how we resource that. And libraries are perfect for that resourcing. So I think with that, I'll go ahead and, um, and uh, hope that I covered the things that were expected and a uh, pleasure to be part of this and off back to you, Don. Thank you so much, Sarah. Great report, such interesting information and challenges. Uh, we're gonna get to questions. I'm sure people have a lot of them. So everyone think about what you'd like to ask these three outstanding individuals uh, to, to, to have respond. So now over to Gloria. Welcome, Gloria. First time on uh, our, our Libraries in Response. We're so happy to have you. So tell us what's happening in the frozen, boiling state of Texas. Well, good good morning, everybody. Thank you, Don. It's great to be with you all uh, this morning. I really appreciate the invitation to participate with this group. And it's wonderful to, to see Sarah and Annie. And we've been emailing funnies to each other this morning. So I, I appreciate that enormously. Um, and actually, I, I mentioned to Dawn earlier, this is a, a great way to talk about the, um, for me anyway, the, the pandemic, because um, I have been working back at the office almost, uh, we went back in uh, almost soon after the pandemic started at the State Library, uh, several of our key staff went back in in May of 2020. So um, I have not been working remotely, but with our great ice storm here in Texas and the Northerners treat me charitably when I talk about a nice storm in Texas, um, but I am working from home. And it, I think the one thing that immediately is conjured in all of our minds when we think about the pandemic is the, the remote work, uh, the displacement. And so it's very familiar uh, to all of us. I still cannot believe we are almost two years into this thing. Um, and I think we are all hopeful that we are at least getting to a point of stability at some point in the not too distant future. So um, we are taking a lot of the lessons that we learned and putting them to use. Uh, I do want to talk about some of our digital initiatives and the broadband money, and I will come back to that at the end. But let me let me circle a, a little bit first to uh, what the state library did uh, in response to the pandemic very quickly. And I'm sure it's going to mirror uh, what almost everyone else has done. We got staff working from home very quickly. We went through all of the uh, permutations of figuring out uh, which technology was going to work, computers and devices and hours and, and keeping people safe. So like you all, we, we did that. And then throughout the two years, there have been times when we were able to bring staff uh, in and had to uh, ask staff to stay out a little bit longer. Uh, the result of all of that is I, I think we are at a much more nimble place in, in terms of uh, knowing that staff can work uh, very well uh, remotely for extended periods of time. We balance that with knowing that there is an awful lot to be gained by uh, synergy and just get being able to see one another. Uh, so we, we are at a place where we have a, a combination of teleworking and, and on-site working, a little more teleworking right now because of the current surge. But I think that uh, as we look at the pandemic and the results of it, uh, more internally, I think that's probably one of the big learning areas for libraries, which were staff needs, uh, staff preferences, staff morale. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, all of us uh, are very aware that uh, not just us, but our staff are coming through this with very different expectations of, of what their safety, uh, uh, how we should take care of their safety, uh, giving them more flexibility to work from home. And then what that entails for the organization, uh, being able to remain responsive and continue to do our work. Uh, so those are uh, areas that I know we have all explored, and I think that they will continue to uh, affect how we shape business operations into the future, because that affects everything from uh, the space that we have in our facility when staff are coming in, what that means for public services. Uh, we all need, know we need to do social distancing now. Is that going to be the same two years from now? Does that mean that we have a lot of public service areas um, that uh, will be used in different ways? We are tackling all of these issues, uh, knowing that we have to be responsive right now, but this landscape could change very easily in two years. So uh, it, it's, it's hard to make permanent permanent decisions right now on things like space when we we really don't know what it's going to look like. Uh, 
and we want to be very uh, protective of our public spaces and the space that we have for our staff. I don't think I have to tell any administrator that uh, once you lose uh, a physical footprint, it's very difficult to get that back. Uh, so it's, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking along the lines of uh, what's happening now, but wanting to make sure that as we do consider growth and we do need to grow in the future that uh, we're, we're not uh, responding uh, preemptively to something right now. We also, during the pandemic, again, like you all, created this inordinate amount of online programs because we could no longer do a lot of on-site or face-to-face -face programming. Uh, so we did a lot of virtual programming and our extraordinary staff uh, worked tirelessly uh, to bring more e-resources online. Uh, we uh, added, uh, especially during the summer of, of 2020, uh, more uh, databases that uh, our staff worked with uh, uh, publishers to make available uh, during that summer when people needed more resources and learning material. We launched an ebook uh, uh, program for Texas. Uh, we put up lots of resources for libraries, communications tools, um, all of the things that I'm sure all of the other state libraries did and libraries in general were doing. I mean, everybody was very aggressively promoting uh, uh, digital programming. What I think we have learned now is that, yes, the public expect it, expects it, they need it, but it's, it's also a much savvier consumer group now. Uh, I think uh, we first learned we can put up programming fairly easily and we can teach people to do that, but there was so much competition there. At some point, the, the market, so to speak, was so saturated with material. I think we we have learned that we really want to always put out quality uh, online resources and, and uh, training out there, but it really has to be engaging. There are so many people uh, and providers that have jumped into that mix. Uh, so where do libraries fit in? I mean, it, it is truly making sure that we continue to be engaging and interactive uh, and that we are still a trusted place for truth, uh, for good quality information. And these are the things that make us stand out. Uh, so again, the, the, the watershed of this pandemic, it, no one's questioning, oh, do we need to be digital? Uh, do people need to have access to devices? I, I think all that was uh, definitively settled. Now the question is, how do we uh, provide those the best of resources? We also, during the pandemic, uh, had a lot of uh, uh, an influx of a lot of funding uh, uh, through uh, federal grant programs and uh, our wonderful federal partners, the uh, Institute for Museum and Library Services, uh, has worked with uh, state agencies to, to help us as we uh, deploy those funds, first CARES funds. In Texas, we got, uh, I think, $2.6 million, and then ARPA funds uh, last spring of $8.4 million. And we, in the middle of the pandemic, like everyone else, we were uh, continuing our programs, figuring out how to serve our, our, our audiences remotely, and then also ingesting a very large amount of money that staff had to figure out, we've got to get this out, and we've got to get it out soon. Libraries need this funding. So we're continuing our grant programs, uh, our regular activities, and then also uh, creating these new grant programs and following all of those programs through uh, with libraries. And it, it's uh, kind of a, it's an interesting uh, dichotomy of, of riches. We, we all want and need the funding, but at some point it, it was just so difficult and challenging to deal with uh, just because there was so much activity and, and uh, we have deployed those funds, uh, but we also are aware that it's like walking, running through water. It's it's difficult with uh, shortages in uh, computer chips and electronics, and we have uh, reports, and uh, our libraries are trying to uh, purchase material. So all of this uh, has led us to understand how much more difficult it is uh, just to conduct business processes, procurement. Uh, we are working uh, with libraries to uh, assist them as best we can and knowing that uh, they may be able to put a grant uh, program together fairly quickly, but can they buy the computers in the eight months time or whatever they have to execute the grant? Uh, these are our very real concerns. Um, and we just really want the public to have access to the technology and the resources. Uh, and I think we've done a very good job, and by we, I mean our, our library. Uh, but it is a, a, an ongoing challenge, and I don't think this is going to get better anytime soon. 
Uh, I think the recovery from uh, the pandemic and, and especially the, the procurement process, I, I mean, from paper to everything else, it is taking a, a, a great toll just on how we are able to deploy uh, information resources. So that, that has been an area that we've thought a, a great deal about. Uh, the great retirement, kind of circling back to something that Sarah had mentioned about so much uh, people leaving the profession. And I guess I'm heartened in a way that it's not just libraries, it is everywhere. Um, recruiting is difficult, uh, largely because folks have had a change of heart in terms of what they want to do. Uh, people have decided they want to stay home or need to stay home and take care of kids. It has just been a time when uh, there's been a lot of personal assessing about uh, life and professions. And so it, it has been, I think, difficult to recruit on all fronts. I can say, at least for Texas, but talking with uh, human resource departments and other agencies, it, there are lots of jobs open, uh, but very difficult to get people. Uh, and so it, that has compounded the difficulties of just dealing with the pandemic and trying to get all of these new programs out. And yet in the middle of all of this, librarians do what they have always done, which is just persevere and get through. Um, we have deployed all of these funds. Uh, we, we have been able to work uh, with our communities to uh, get things like hotspots and Wi-Fi uh, material and uh, boy, uh, self-service kiosks and, a digi and additional digital resources. So all of that funding that has funneled through, um, a lot of that funding that has funneled through is making its way to our community. So it, it, as challenging it has, as it has all been, I do think that the re part of the upshot of the, the pandemic is that we have this incredible flow of funding. And I think that uh, uh, as an administrator, and I think everyone else uh, uh, who is dealing with the funds understands this is a a once in a lifetime opportunity, at least a generational opportunity for libraries. I don't, I don't recall seeing this much money coming forward in such a short time. And that brings incredible opportunity. Um, and that leads me to another point of uh, sort of the pandemic and where we are in assessing. It is really important from our perspective to try to plan the, the deployment of these funds very strategically, especially in the area of broadband. Uh, you know, as we've said, there, there is no question now about the importance of broadband. It's not just libraries, a few groups saying everybody has to be digitally connected. Now everybody gets it because they had to, everybody lived it. Uh, so now we have this massive infusion of, of dollars coming in uh, to the states, to libraries, but just to, to states in general. So let me give you a couple of quick numbers um, of what we have in Texas. So uh, we have the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, which was part of the large ARPA money. This was not the, the dedicated funds uh, that we have received from IMLS. This is a uh, other block of that money that has gone to the state. Texas received $500 million for broadband. $500 million. There is uh, There was legislation in our last session uh, to kind of create a framework for how that was going to be spent. And uh, I know you heard from Mark Smith, our, our, our former director, who was very heavily involved in this. And, and he and I worked together with other groups to uh, work toward the creation of a broadband office in Texas. And that was first established in the governor's office. And then a formal broadband development office was created in the comptroller's office. So it is that office now that is in receipt of that those $500 million. And we have been partnering with uh, the broadband development office to provide them information um, and working with other agencies to try to create a sort of a roadmap for what that funding is going to look like in Texas. And I think that goes to the point of um, wanting to build smart. Uh, it's wonderful to have the funding, but there is so much need. Uh, the danger with it isn't to, we don't want to recreate the wheel. Uh, we want to put money and build on those projects and uh, the infrastructure that's being set. And it's really difficult uh, in a state uh, the size of Texas, where we have so many rural communities uh, and just the geography is so, so broad, bringing last minute uh, connection to a last mile connection to a lot of uh, the, the rural, rural Texas is very costly. So being able to do that strategically and meaningfully uh, is, is a challenge. That's one of the areas this broadband development office is, is looking at with mapping uh, projects and so on. But they also realize how large it is. And it was very gratifying 
uh, that they knew to reach out to us. Uh, again, we have really talented staff here uh, who have been parts of those discussions. And uh, we are really looking at trying to create um, a partnership uh, to look at things uh, from the infrastructure perspective, but also building up over time with things like digital inclusion and equity, digital literacy. And for our part, uh, we know we have a lot to bring to that conversation and it is incumbent upon the library community to be able to share that voice, to be able to say meaningfully, this is the work of libraries in these areas. This is what we can bring to communities. This is how we can help the state uh, deliver on, on its priorities. And so with that work, uh, we, uh, the State Library put forward an application to uh, create a tiered approach over the next five years. And uh, that 500 million from the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund um, has an extend date by December, 2026. So that gives us um, uh, some good time for planning. Uh, so we have been notified uh, that we have preliminary approval to start receiving a, a little over $6 million uh, to start actually creating some uh, some programs to support actual build out, out actual infrastructure in libraries. Um, and so we're hoping to be able to uh, uh, certainly equip up, up to 60 libraries over those over those years to really get them connected and potentially more. That's one of the projects that we have talked with them. We've also uh, put forward ideas for things like uh, digital literacy over these next few years. Uh, which uh, relates very nicely into some other areas of uh, the bigger infrastructure package that the, uh, was just recently uh, uh, passed by the, the federal government, and that's the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and that's $1.2 trillion with $65 billion going to broadband. That's not the $500 million that came to Texas. This is a separate pot. From that amount, all states are going to get a minimum of $100 million for broadband. Uh, in addition to that, there's $2.8 billion for the Digital Equity Act that's going to go to states. Uh, and so in Texas, we're looking at those pieces. Uh, most of that funding is going to be funneled through this uh, broadband development office, which is why this partnership with that office is particularly important. So we have given them some ideas of what the state library can do to support initiatives like uh, digital literacy. And we are trying to embed uh, our current projects, and we have a great deal with uh, 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 Libraries Connecting Texas, our work to support e-rate uh, applications in, in libraries, uh, we, uh, our digital navigator program that we are piloting uh, with ARPA funds. Uh, we are planning a, a digital uh, equity uh, summit based on a, some, a survey and report that we are commissioned to have done and completed this summer. So we're trying to lay the groundwork to understand where Texas libraries are right now, where our communities are with, re with respect to digital literacy and that relationship to, to libraries and trying to use that to build not only our ARPA programs and complete that, but also to use that uh, to help us understand the state of libraries so that as we go through using and applying for uh, more of this other federal money that we're able to build on those programs. Uh, because I think Sarah was exactly right. There, There is so much money and uh, we, we need to be at the table uh, to first have access to those funds, and frankly, to be able to say how those funds should be used uh, through libraries, because uh, nobody's going to know uh, if we don't tell them. So, and I will end with that. And uh, Don, come on in. Great, Gloria. Uh, I mean, what a what a you and Sarah both make this point about uh, these funds flowing. It's it's a flood, and you know, coping with that is is a major challenge. I mean, it's it's the preferred challenge. But it's easy to anticipate that that will, you know, move through, and after that, it will be followed probably by a drought. It's just the way of things. So, spend in anticipation that this is, there's going to be a gap before any new funding comes through, and try to make the very most of what's happening right now. Uh, great, great stuff. So, we need to turn over to Andy right now to uh, give us our. Uh, third and final presentation for the morning. Annie, welcome. Welcome back. It's good to have you. Thank and you, Don. Let me uh, pull up my slides here. All right. All right. Uh, I love that. Uh, okay. Those icons you have there on the side. Trying to find my... There we go. Can you see that? Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you. 
And uh, I want to thank Don for inviting me here. And, and I have, he didn't tell you, but I have to tell you, this presentation is duct taped together because he, he asked me just this week, well, would I present next week? And I was like, sure. And then yesterday he says, would you present tomorrow? <laughs> I was like, I don't know why I said yes, but here I am. And so this is- uh, you're duct great. Tape. That's why you said yes. <laughs> duct taped it from other presentations, but um, I'm really um, delighted to be here with Sarah and Gloria. Welcome back, Sarah. I, I loved working with Sarah in the past and I'm excited to meet Gloria and um, um, you know, look forward to seeing them both in person at, at some point. Uh, and of course, I love working with Don. He's always doing exciting, fun things. So I can't say no to Don. Um, but uh, both uh, Sarah and Gloria were uh, talking about recruitment and those difficulties. And I, you know, we've got uh, a lot of good things going on, but also a lot of need. So this is a little bit of shameless recruitment. Yay, Delaware, come to Delaware. Uh, so come help us here. So um, uh, Delaware Libraries uh, had uh, also did a lot of what was mentioned earlier during the pandemic. Uh, they're, we're really proud of their pandemic pivots. Uh, and it included uh, the library parking lot wireless, food distribution and COVID testing and more in the, in, in the parking lot. Uh, online library card registration. Uh, we expanded eBooks, OverDrive, added Hoopla, virtual programs. Uh, I love that part of the staff were uh, so great with their experimentation. I just love seeing that. Uh, curbside checkout, story walks, outdoor programs. We had uh, got finally got Chromebooks and MiFi's for loaning. Uh, and uh, our reference librarians, our social workers, and the employment specialists uh, from the Department of Labor, they all moved to online appointments. And I do have to say, uh, since I'm talking about, uh, I said about recruitment, our head of virtual reference, I see Missy Williams is on here today. And I got to tell you, Sarah, she, she actually lives in Washington State. I really shouldn't admit that, but... <laughs> because <laughs> she's awesome, awesome uh, reference librarian. Um, plus a, a few pivots uh, that we believe may be uh, unique to Delaware. We did implement Dolly Parton's Imagination Library uh, for preschoolers statewide, which was a perfect service during the pandemic because it's books by mail. Uh, and we're receiving more attention for this program than anything we've ever done. So it's highly recommended and I'm happy to talk with anybody about that or anything else that um, I'm touching on today. Um, so Nick, uh, let me go on to this one. Whoops. All right, let me get back up a minute, sorry. Um, I, uh, let me go one back, sorry. So I, I also wanted to say that Nick Martin, who had presented earlier um, to uh, for one of Don's sessions, he had talked about tele telehealth kiosks, which we have, so I'm not going to go uh, into that more. Um, uh, we also I mentioned the Chromebooks and MiFi's. We have had about a third loss in, in those. So the next grant that Nick uh, is applying for, he's looking to do like a learn to earn where patrons get to keep the equipment after training. Um, they're keeping it anyway, but this <laughs> they uh, probably get some uh, digital um, uh, literacy training as well as part of that. Uh, and as reported in American Libraries, the, um, it, we had a partnership with the uh, Department of Health and Social Services to distribute COVID test kits to the public, which um, of course other states have done as well. We were fortunate that they gave us $10,000 per library for their efforts. And that was actually based on a partnership that we had years ago with DENREC, which is uh, the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control. Uh, we work with them to distribute energy efficient light bulbs. And uh, there was uh, some money for libraries through that, not $10,000, but some, some funds. Um, and that received the Governor's Team Excellence Award uh, at that time. Uh, so our, our, we have a building consultant, Margaret Sullivan. She provided recommendations for each library that uh, wanted to participate uh, for outdoor library spaces uh, to help move their services out, uh, outside. 
Uh, and currently for library construction, Delaware is very generous. This, uh, I, I believe there are 15 states that provide uh, funds for construction. Uh, Delaware is one of those. The state provides up to 50% for library construction. And yes, we're small enough that I can fit a, a thumbnail of every library on one page. I know Texas and Washington, it would go on <laughs> for pages, uh, but we can see at a glance uh, all of these uh, libraries. Our goal is one square foot per capita, and we have more than doubled our square footage in the last decade. Uh, so in the bond bill, um, and we typically get, I don't know, say around $5 million, $4 or $5 million a year ranges uh, based on the projects for construction funding. And this year, I think we asked for about, um, what do we asked for about $13 million, something like that. But anyway, the, when the governor's state of the state, he just uh, recommended $26.8 million. So the governor like doubled uh, what we had even asked for for construction. And apparently that's not all that the libraries are gonna get more uh, money for construction from the state ARPA funds, which hasn't been announced yet. And I, we think that's probably another 15 million, but that's gonna help the, the libraries in the low income area provide the local match. Uh, there's one library in particular, Harrington, which is, uh, you know, has never had a renovation, is in an old funeral home. That's the one that's like, I gotta get done. <laughs> And um, they're, this is going to help because they'll have the match uh, to do it. But we're going to need a lot of help with the federal requirements. Uh, we don't, we're not familiar with them at all. We've, there was a rumor I heard yesterday at our council libraries meeting that, um, that we may be able to use state requirements, but I don't know that yet. So um, look, we're going to need help for that. Um, uh, so in Delaware, the state funds 100% of library technologies, and that's for our statewide network, our catalog, our calendar, as well as PCs and, and all the technologies on site uh, in the libraries and support. Uh, I have a great IT team. Um, the library ARPA funds that we got, the, the library uh, version of it, we provided grants to all the public libraries first, right off the top. Uh, and then we're implementing RFID finally uh, with the uh, other funds with, for about half of the public libraries to start. Um, our state aid funding, uh, Delaware was uh, at one point was about ranked seventh in the nation for uh, state aid. And we've been you know, dropping, we're, of course it depends on what the other states are, are doing too, but I think we were down to about ninth, uh, but uh, you know, and it was flat. So the state uh, aid increased six hundred thousand dollars last year, and the governor just recommended an additional seven hundred fifty thousand dollar increase for this coming year. So, um, which is awesome. Uh, the council and libraries just celebrated their one hundred twentieth anniversary, and ironically, are now under sunset review. Uh, but fortunately, the legislative staff recommended continuation. And we're asking to expand the charge to encompass school libraries. So although public libraries have been improving, the school libraries have been getting worse for decades. The situation is so bad now that the, the Delaware Association of School Librarians doesn't have officers. Every library is helping us uh, quite a bit. Well, they're helping us with public library, all the libraries, but um, especially with the school libraries. And there's some interest in the legislature to tackle the school libraries uh, for school librarian positions, as well as adding school libraries to the statewide Delaware Library catalog. And we will need lots of help with that. And here's the slide I was looking for earlier about the telehealth and, and Nick out of order, as I say, duct tape. <laughs> Um, so COVID uh, showcased our need to further develop partnerships to help people. My head of the, the social innovation team out the Porterfield was just beside herself because people were in such desperate needs. It's like, all right, um, you know, do what you can, but I'm calling in some, some help. And so we uh, signed on to the National Communities of Excellence. Uh, it's a three-year learning collaborative using the Baldridge framework uh, for collective impact. We were the first state, um, uh, statewide initiative, and we're the first library-led initiative. In fact, I don't think libraries are involved. So join, you know, look into that. Um, we also signed on to Unite Delaware, which is a referral network to social service agencies. 
and librarians are registered together under our Delaware Libraries umbrella. And Missy is a uh, lead for us on that. I served on the, uh, through COSLA, I served on the initial work group for Measures That Matter, which was formed because of the challenges with library data and how to showcase outcomes and impact because we created single systems in Delaware, single library systems, we are, were able to include data. We have access to live data and it's uh, included in Open Data Delaware and Kids Count. The ideal would be to have live or current library data at scale across states, across the, the nation, right? Um, that would be ideal. And perhaps blockchain would be a solution uh, I did there I have a chapter in the ALA Futures uh, blockchain book, and I am, but I am not an expert. Don, I am not an expert. <laughs> but um, for our few first Communities of Excellence project, we're focused on equity through literacy. With, uh, we're working with Literacy Delaware and um, lots of partners, early childhood partners. And our hope is to create a literacy dashboard across the lifespan, and that's birth through adult. We need a, a data lake, but that is easier said than done or afforded. We had a sprint with a company called Compass Red, which does data management. Uh, they did a mock-up for us, which we could afford. But then when they gave us the price for build out of this, it was like way out of our, um, our range. Uh, you know, it's only affordable by like healthcare and corporations. Uh, so now we're looking at a, a clear impact scorecard based on um, Mark Friedman results-based accountability, which uh, I think Montana and libraries and some other places are uh, uh, working with this. Uh, Peggy Geisler is our consultant for collective impact. And she points out that we also need to achieve greater consistency across libraries and our uh, services, like story times and, and such like that. So, you know, we brought everybody together in, net, in a network, but we need more consistency uh, across our services in order to be able to measure impacts and outcomes. So that's, uh, that's what I have for you today and I'm happy to entertain questions. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Annie. That's that's great, great stuff. I mean, I think maybe we over over scheduled today because each of you could fill a whole hour easily, and each of you deal with hundreds of issues that are interesting and relevant. So uh, please accept our apologies for trying to put too much in too little space, but that's kind of what you were all talking about. You're trying to do the same kind of thing with your institutions. Um, it's clear that life has changed. I mean, did, did any, is there any precedent for how suddenly and how massively civilization was upended two years ago with the arrival of this, uh, uh, this health crisis? And I mean, everybody in the world suddenly had to deal with it. They had to conform to what the virus would allow us to do and not do. And we've been through all these changes. We're still trying to figure it out. It's going to go on for a while, maybe permanent kind of semi-condition. Maybe it's kind of tuned us up for dealing with even larger problems. We'll just have to see about that. Um, there were some questions that were sent in earlier um, that... Uh, okay, we're going to go to the, because uh, we're just coming up in the end of the hour, I just want everybody to try to match the quote. It's back up uh, at the 812 mark. I posted the, the quotes in the chat. Uh, nothing in this world can take place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Uh, so, okay. And Don, if I can, in final hey, shout out, um, yes. just so, um, because I didn't cover it as well as my colleagues, is that our work would simply not be possible um, without the Institute of Museums and Library Services and both CARES and ARPA. And I think it really demonstrates the leadership of that team and of Crosby Kemper, knowing that we needed flexibility and we needed to be able to do this quickly and efficiently. And 
um, just want to make sure that that's a, a clear shout out to them how important that uh, that funding has been to us. A great point, thank you, Sarah. And, and it's absolutely true that IMLS has had to uh, negotiate this flow of funds without really being able to spend it on process on personnel to handle uh, all, all these new uh, demands. So they're squeaking. Cross has done a great job. You know, he's a great guy, really smart guy, and uh, he's just about to turn the corner on his midpoint of his uh, term, his four-year term, uh, and uh, it's a great ad for IMLS. Uh, but as you pointed out, a lot of these funds are flowing not through these federal uh, agencies, uh, but through, uh, through the states. This is what the Fed has done with this, is basically say that the federal government does not have the capability to actually manage all these funds in, in terms of grants. So we're going to hand them over to the states and let them do it. So now the states are struggling to accommodate uh, uh, that, that enormous uh, challenge. Um, we are at the hour. Um, we normally close and then everybody's invited to kind of hang around, uh, you know, off, off recording and I don't know if off the, off the record too, I suppose, but we don't really care much about that anyway. Uh, but we do want to uh, take a moment and ask everyone to unmute, please unmute right now, everyone unmute. Because if we were together in, uh, at a conference somewhere, uh, everybody unmute, please. Nicole, Andy, everybody, we would, we, would, we would give these presenters a round of applause. Well, that's what we're going to do right now. So I'd like everybody to <laughs> round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much. That's great. So we'll be back with um, uh, more of these. We're, we're engaging with other uh, state chiefs right now to set up a schedule. We'll have more of these and hear from more different parts of the country because we think this, uh, this emphasis at the, at the state level is absolutely uh, appropriate right now for how things are unfolding. And we'll uh, get into a bunch of these areas that you know, will, are so interesting uh, as we go forward. And so thanks everybody for, for tuning in again. We hope you'll come back. And with that, we will close the recording right now.